Please welcome our 2022 residential advisors and new student orientation program leaders. Please welcome our esteemed Columbia University alumni. Please stand and welcome our Columbia University faculty, staff, and participants in today's convocation ceremony.
Please be seated. Yes! <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jessica Marinaccio, and as your Dean of Undergraduate Admissions and Financial Aid, and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and as the person who signed all of the admission letters that you worked so very, very hard to earn, I want to officially welcome you to the Columbia community. You're finally here. <laughs> Joining me on stage today are President Bollinger, Executive Vice President of Arts and Sciences, Amy Hungerford, Dean Surrett of Columbia College, Dean Chang of Columbia Engineering, Ted Schweitzer. <laughs> Ted Schweitzer, President of the Columbia College Alumni Association, Columbia Engineering Alumni Association President, Alexander Putuletsky, excuse me, Putuletsky, and NSOP committee member Fidel Martinez. <laughs> also joining us, also joining us are distinguished alumni esteemed faculty, dedicated staff, and as you have already heard, committed and enthusiastic student volunteers. All gathered. All gathered here for the purpose of welcoming you on this special day for our entire university community. Special because convocation is the ceremony where aspiring Colombians finally become truly Colombians. Welcome again, class of 2026. Today, your first official day at Columbia is the culmination of years of effort, accomplishment, and dedication. A day when it may seem that all your hopes and dreams have been fulfilled. But in fact, this is a day when hopes and dreams just begin to take shape. Because education is about inquiry and challenge and promise and change, leading to new hopes and bigger dreams that you may not no, even now, exist. This evening, you stand on the cusp of an experience that will change your life. Consider the loved ones beside you and those wishing you well from afar. What they all share is the desire to in, support you on this incredible journey that you embark on today. And of course, family and friends, this is a big day for you too. A challenging one, maybe, but one which I hope you will embrace with great joy. And so we also proudly welcome you to the Columbia family. Can we give a round of applause to family and loved ones? <laughs> Class of 2026, coming from every state. <laughs> I said they were enthusiastic. <laughs> Coming from every state uh, in the United States and nearly 80 countries from around the world. Coming with a rich tapestry of backgrounds, viewpoints, interests, and experience. Today and from now on, you are Columbia. And as someone who knew you a little bit at the very beginning, I will watch you on the, how you embark upon this next chapter of your life 
with great anticipation and admiration. Welcome again, class of 2026. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I would now like to introduce NSOP coordinator Fidel Martinez. This would get a lot of applause. <laughs> Hailing from McAllen, Texas. Texas, okay. <laughs> In Syracuse, New York. New York? <laughs> Fidel is a member of the Columbia College class of 2023, majoring in neuroscience and behavior. Fidel is an assistant researcher at the Taub Institute, a volunteer in the emergency department at Mount Sinai Hospital, a leader in Columbia Synapse, an NSOP lifer, <laughs> and a father, as he has told me, of six plants. <laughs> After first serving on the NSOP committee as the events coordinator his sophomore year, Fidel decided to take on the challenge of being the Columbia College and Columbia Engineering Student Leader Coordinator of the 2022 New Student Orientation Program so that he could help students fall in love with Columbia and New York City as much as he has. Oh. <laughs> I, it's true. <laughs> he can always be found sitting on low steps with a large coffee or buying sushi from Learner Cafe. So please keep an eye out for him and introduce yourself throughout this week and into the year to come. Please join me in welcoming Fidel to the podium. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Dean Marinaccio. And hello, class of 2026. It is my pleasure to welcome you as Young Lions. I know, by now, you must have heard this a million times. But let me just say, congratulations at arriving at your newest destination in life, Columbia University. Now, please join me in thanking all of the orientation leaders, crew captains, committee members, and resident advisors that helped our new students settle in at Columbia on their first day. <laughs> Enthusiastic, yes, they are. Anyways, speaking of orientation leaders, just after the ceremony, you will all finally get to meet your OL and other traveling companions in person. Each and every one of them is thrilled to welcome you into our Columbia community and to welcome you to the true start of your new student orientation program, or NSOP, an entire week. an entire week dedicated to giving you a taste test of what it's like to live in your new home and learning what it means to be a Columbia student. You will work through the beginning of your college roadmap at Columbia in New York City. I think I can speak for each of us when I say that we are excited and proud to help you navigate the start of your new journey as a Columbia student. Are you all ready to hop in? So, this year's theme is Road Trip Inspired, which seems fitting considering the journey you're all about to start alongside one another. Today, you will receive a new map to explore with new traveling companions, and like the start of every wild road trip, morale is high, the windows are down, and the best music is playing. Yet, it is without a doubt that there will be bumps, unexpected forks in the road, and the trip may get exhausting at times. But let's take a second to park the car. Take a look around. No, seriously, class of 2026, take a look around. 
Even amid the detours and traffic jams, there is beauty around you. There are friends, whether you have met them already or not, around you. Your family is just a call away, and the city is now in your hands. This journey that you are embarking today is what I wanted to talk to you about. Three years ago, I began my journey as a young lion. <laughs> All around me were unfamiliar, yet excited faces ready to floor it and start driving. Confident, but still unsure of what lies on the road ahead. As you will see, NSOP is the most blissful, non-stop part of the trip. I rushed from event to event, met dozens of students today, and after, explored a city that has endless possibilities. But afterwards, a wave of exhaustion came over me. Before truly starting the year, I needed rest. My first pit stop. You see, <laughs> you see, at the time, I had convinced myself that I would be the perfect student. Max credits every semester, going to every office hour, 8.40 a.m. classes, and perfect grades. But my journey was not like that, and I took many unexpected turns. At times, I slept through my 840s. I bombed an exam here and there. I'm sure that people can relate. And I lost friends along the way, too. I also pulled all-nighters to make it to my destination. At the time, I was so caught up in graduating that I didn't even pause to take in all the views. So I parked my car for just a moment to reflect, and I came to realize this journey is just as important as a destination. Today, I have come to appreciate my Columbia journey for what it is. <laughs> Memories with my best friends, a deeper discovery of who I am and what I enjoy, unforgettable experiences throughout the city, celebrations after a tough biology exam, countless traditions that are shared throughout our community, and so much more all parts that are critical to the formation of who you will be. My road trip has not always been windows down, music blasting. Some days it poured rain like no other, but the sun will always rise to shine on your journey. Never forget, your journey is your own. No one else can experience it for you. Do not be afraid of detours, unexpected pit stops, or taking the wheel on your own trip. Remember, you are never alone here at Columbia. You will always find the NSOP crew, your OLs, your RAs, faculty, advisors, and staff along the way. So, class of 2026, are you ready to hop in? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Big shout out to all my OLs and crew captains. Thank you very much, Fidel. And can we give another round of applause to this amazing leader who gave such wise advice? <laughs> I'm continuously awed by our students. <laughs> I would like now to call forward Alexander Potuletsky. Uh, president of the Columbia Engineering Alumni Association. Engineering? That's okay. <laughs> Alex, who received his master's from CS in 2010, is a section manager at Con Edison, where he manages the team responsible for strategic planning of the New York City STEAM system. Prior to this role, Alex held various positions in operations, engineering, and project management at Con Edison, Sikorsky Aircraft, and the U.S. Department of Energy. A licensed professional engineer, Alex holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Columbia, <laughs> and an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. Please, no. <laughs> All education is wonderful, and it has brought him to this point to speak to you. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Alex to the podium. <laughs> no, don't stress it.
Thank you, Dean Marinaccio. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the roughly 45,000 living Columbia alumni, engineering alumni, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate you and welcome you, the class of 2026, to Morningside Heights. Today you join one of the most prestigious academic communities in one of the most dynamic cities in the world. Um, and you begin a rewarding educational experience that will stay with you forever. I have no doubt that Columbia and our engineering school will play an integral part in your lifelong pursuit, and many of you will lead the way in creating innovative, real-world solutions that will forge stronger, more equitable society. Columbia faculty are world-renowned for groundbreaking research and scholarship. New York offers unrivaled culture, industry, and energy that will serve to enrich your classroom learning experiences. And of course, you the students, are among the best and the brightest. Together, these elements will foster Columbia's vibrant community. So as you begin your studies at this great institution, I'd like to impart several pieces of advice. First and most important, I ask that you be mindful of your own needs during your time at Columbia. Sleep, grades, and friends. One of the challenges facing students at any academically rigorous school is being able to have all three. Striking a work-life balance is important, is an important life skill that with effort, I firmly believe that you can have it all. Sufficient rest, great friends, and an excellence in academic achievement. <laughs> yeah. Columbia students have a reputation for being remarkably self-sufficient, but even the most self-reliant among us need assistance from time to time. Don't hesitate to lean on your peers, your professors, the staff, and the administrators as you find the balance that's right for you. What's more, Columbia Engineering Alumni Association is committed to support you throughout your lifetime, both as a student and after graduation. There are a plethora of programs and events, offerings and opportunities to meet and socialize with alumni. I encourage you to seek out these events and learn from the experience of Columbians who have gone before you. The alumni are eager to meet you and help you guide you through your Columbia journey. I hope you'll take full advantage of the tremendous resources available to you and that you will have fun along the way. Welcome to Columbia and the community. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Columbia Engineering Dean Shifu Chang. Shifu Chang is Dean of Columbia Engineering and Richard Dicker Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering with a joint appointment in the Department of Computer Science. Dean Chang leads the education, research, and innovation mission of Columbia Engineering with more than 230 faculty, 1,700 undergrad, and 2,600 grad students. He played a key role in leading the school to develop the Columbia Engineering for Humanity vision and to, and to recruit and advance the growing faculty. He co-leads cross-disciplinary initiatives and industry collaborations and co-spearheaded development of the school's strategy to diversity, equity, and inclusion. An expert in computer vision, machine learning, and multi-modal multi content analysis, Dean Chang received the Keo uh, Tommy, Tommy Yasu Award in IEEE and Distinguished Alumni Award from the National Taiwan University. Among his awards, he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Computing, Machinery, and IEEE, and an elected acad academician of Academy uh, Sinica. He is also an Amazon scholar and the inaugural director uh, for Columbia Center of AI Technology in collaboration with Amazon. Dean Chang received his BS from National Taiwan University in 1985 and his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1993. Please join me in welcoming Dean Chang.
Hello and welcome. Welcome to Columbia University. And welcome to our engineering and college students. And welcome class of 2026. A round of applause. Today is truly an exciting day, and myself and the faculty have been looking forward to this day all summer, and I know all of you have been waiting for this moment too. Today marks a big milestone for you, your family, and loved ones. It's a time of incredible change and growth you will never forget about today of your life. Your high school education happened during a historical time in our world. A global pandemic made part of education remote. Wherever you come from, you are all united by this common experience. It gives you a unique bond and understanding of one another. I know this bond will continue to grow as you take classes together, participate in clubs and activity together, and explore this amazing city, New York City, I would say is the greatest city in the world. And you'll be learning from one another and be enriched by your friendships with people from different and diverse backgrounds. You'll be learning from a brilliant and engaged faculty. There's so much opportunity for you here inside and outside the classroom. Our students will benefit from the renowned and enduring Columbia Corps For engineering students, the opportunity to pursue knowledge of the liberal arts and humanities give them the unique benefits of combining solid engineering training with the skill of critical thinking and global perspectives. It truly helps form the type of the leaders our society needs. Leaders who understand the challenges facing our world from different angles. This opportunity of interdisciplinary education is a true strength of our university. From the start, Columbia Engineering has been a school engaged with New York City and the world. Our faculty and alumni help our nation pursue industrial progress and advances in technology. We help create technology for long distance telephone, FM radio, computers to connect people. We contribute to the development of X-rays and the mass production of antibiotics to save lives and improve human health. <laughs> Recently, we launched a large interdisciplinary effort to combine artificial intelligence, data science, and climate science to improve the climate models and contribute to solutions for climate mitigation and adaptation. We fully support what President Bollinger have called the fourth purpose of a university. As Columbia faculty and students, we are committed to using our knowledge and breakthroughs in the service of society. At engineering, we call this engineering for humanity. For engineering students, please remember this. Next time when I see you, I'll quiz you on this topic. <laughs> this is a vision that inspires all of us in the school. It includes five areas we believe to have the most positive impact. Healthy, sustainable, connected, secure, and creative humanity. You don't have to remember all of these five. <laughs> Each of you will help support this vision and bring this to life. And you will see this vision in action when you help tackle many challenges facing our society today. From the threat of climate change, ongoing challenges in global health, the necessity for technology that's accessible, ethical, and fair, and the urgent need for more inclusion and diversity throughout all sectors of society.
engineers are natural problem solvers. As the dean of engineering school, I invite you all, whatever area you major, to take on this approach. It is fundamentally optimistic and endlessly creative, I guarantee it. It pursues long-term solutions and focus on people instead of problems. I know your generation and all of you are up to the task. As you continue your Columbia journey, you meet so many friends, mentors, and teachers that become part of a lifelong network. Earlier this week, we learned of the sad news that one of our new students, Baha El Awada, died in a tragic accident. Like all of you, I was deeply saddened to know that such a brilliant young life was cut short and he would not be with us. But I was incredibly moved by the outpouring of condolences and messages of support for Faha's family from across Columbia and from many of you. That's what makes our Columbia community so special. It's truly a family, Columbia family. And you are all part of this family now. So before your classes begin, let's spend some time with one another and enjoying the beginning of a wonderful journey. I cannot wait to meet all of you Congratulations again, and welcome to Columbia. Thank you, Dean Chang. I would now like to introduce Ted Schweitzer, graduate of the Columbia College Class of 1991 and president of the Columbia College Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. Yep. Applause. <laughs> Ted is a managing director at Pluto Partners, a real estate investment, development, and management firm based in Los Angeles. Prior to founding Pluto Partners, Mr. Schweitzer spent 15 years working at Tishman Spire in New York and began his career as an associate at Shearman, Sterling, and Rogers and Wells. Since July of 2020, he has served as president of the Columbia College Alumni Association and is a member of the Board of Governors of the Columbia Club of New York. He was previously on the Community Advisory Board of New York Public Radio, a member of the New York Presbyterian Hospital Planned Giving Advisory Council, and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He also volunteered at the University of Chicago Medical Center Field Hospital in Haiti. Mr. Schweitzer earned his Bachelor of Arts from, from Columbia College in 1991 <laughs> and his JD from Columbia Law School in 1994. Please join me in welcoming Ted to the podium. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, class of 2026. My name is Ted Schweitzer, and I graduated from the great class of 1991. I'm honored to be president of the Columbia College Alumni Association. On behalf of the more than 52,000 living Columbia College alumni, welcome to the Columbia family. In what seems like prehistoric times, I arrived from California for my own orientation in Lowe Library. The city was far grittier. Ed Koch was mayor. 42nd Street resembled scenes from the movie Midnight Cowboy. And the meatpacking district still had a few active slaughterhouses. In Carmen, my four sweetmates shared one phone which was attached to the wall. There was no such thing as a paleo meal plan. <laughs> and my desktop computer required biceps to move it around. But the feelings on this day of excitement and trepidation remain the same. You arrive here after many years of preparation and dare I say it, competition. A Latin proverb springs to mind, homo, homini lupus est. Man is to man like wolf. 
Sigmund Freud explores the phrase's implications in his book, Civilizations and Its Discontents, which you may read in the core curriculum. At Columbia, your lupine peers compete and distinguish themselves in the realm of intellectual and academic and athletic achievement. And yet, there is a bigger impetus here on campus, a motivating force that transcends the beast referenced in the proverb. And that is our shared intellectual curiosity that propels us towards something greater, the pursuit of knowledge, truth, and meaning. I encourage you to take advantage of everything available to you at Columbia. I delight in introducing our newly minted Dean of Columbia College, Professor Yosef Soret. <laughs> Professor Soret, who first came to Columbia in 2009, is a brilliant scholar and a beloved teacher. He is professor of religion and African-American and African diaspora studies. Before becoming dean, Professor Soret was chair of the Department of Religion and director of the Center on African-American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. Dean Soret received his bachelor's degree from Oral Roberts University, his master's degree from Boston University, and his PhD at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Dean Soret. Good evening. Thank you, Ted, for that gracious introduction. I'd like to begin by echoing Dean Marinaccio's and my colleagues on the stage and expressing my appreciation to President Bollinger and to all of the faculty, staff, and alum who have joined us this evening. A veritable crowd of Columbia witnesses assembled to welcome the newest members of our community. What could be more inspiring and more exciting than to be the we that we are together tonight. To the class of 2026. <laughs> parents, family, and friends. I'm so pleased to offer my own welcome on behalf of Columbia College, and congratulations to you on arriving at this moment of new beginnings. I'm honored and privileged to start my own journey as Dean of Columbia College and Vice President for Undergraduate Education, alongside yours. This occasion provides an opportunity to reflect on our shared purpose and the curiosity and questions that drew us to New York City, to Columbia, and to Low Plaza specifically this evening. When I started college, I did not know what it meant to be an academic, I thought I knew what I wanted to study, which is not what I teach today, but I was there because I wanted to play basketball. I certainly never expected to become a professor at a place like Columbia, teaching courses on race and religion in American culture. Not exactly the lightest of topics these days or ever. As I think is often the case, my professional journey that is my path to the professoriate and now to the dean's office, begun with a more personal yet rather mundane and unexceptional set of everyday experiences. As a black boy growing up in Massachusetts, shuttling back and forth between the city of Boston and small town Lincoln throughout much of my childhood, I learned to navigate through a set of places and social spaces that repl reflected the complicated histories of race as well as religion that shape our contemporary world. The various kinds of difference, be of culture or of economic class, that define these contexts 
proved formative, not only as I became of age as a young man, but also eventually in shaping so many of the questions that preoccupy me to this day as a scholar. When I landed in Tulsa, Oklahoma for college, a couple cheers for Tulsa's okay. In August of 1991, my freshman year roommate had grown up on an apple farm in rural Ohio in a space that, we'll just say, okay, was homogeneous, to say the least. That year, our dorm room became a space of vibrant exchange between us and our varied circle of friends, which were largely black and white, respectively. We talked late into the hours, not just about race, but about the significance of the cultural and social worlds that shaped us, that we brought to campus with, it, with us, and that did or did not connect in ways that made sense to us. We didn't solve any big problems, and the climate on campus was contentious at times, particularly in the absence of any institutional space to talk about these questions. A profound set of questions and tensions emerged in those conversations. And during my years as an undergraduate, I steadily found myself wanting to explore these dynamics in a deeper and more sustained way. What I found in academia several years later and through a circuitous journey were the space and language to pursue my questions with purpose and rigor, as well as a passion for teaching and learning with and from my students. And what I continue to carry with me is a conviction that academia in the academic setting can and must be a source and site of social change in service to the communities from which all of us come. New knowledge that stretches beyond the boundaries of disciplines and the classroom and engages the social world both on and beyond our campus. At its best, Columbia College and the larger university community is such a place. And the holistic nature of the college's mission embodies many of the things that I've been thinking about and committed to for a long time. As dean, my most important responsibility is to steward the education and experience of our students, to ensure that they, that you, have the space and language to ask questions, to take risks, and to make mistakes as they are making sense of the world around them, but also to imagine who they might become and what this world could otherwise be. Doing so requires cultivating a respect for the legacy of generations past, a commitment to safeguarding traditions, but also to opening up space for innovation for generations to come. A delicate dance, indeed, between continuity and change, ensuring that what we provide to our students today is just as transformative as it was for those who preceded them at the college. All of us today here are a vital force in shaping that legacy and tradition. Through the core curriculum, our students become part of something much bigger than the individual, an intellectual community, and an educational experiment in progress for more than a century. This past year, I had the distinct experience of teaching Intro to African American Studies, a relatively new addition to our global core, in the morning. And in the afternoon, I found myself in the classroom with 22 sophomores in contemporary civilization, the oldest element of the core. Across these two classrooms, a range of questions were surfaced by your peers about equality, authority, and difference, but also about changing technologies and community and creativity and so much more. I watched them refine their questions and work through what the answers might mean for who they are, for how and where they fit on this campus and in the broader world. Helping students answer these types of questions at the heart of what the college does and of who we are as a community. You are about to embark on an undergraduate experience long defined by a commitment to dialogue, to diversity of thought and exploration. You must learn for yourself what kind of student you will be, just as I am beginning to learn what kind of dean I will be. We will learn and teach each other so much. You will encounter, discuss, and debate enduring ideas that will challenge you and your professors. You'll gain knowledge, understanding, insight, and empathy. And your views of the, yourself and the world will rightfully evolve. Along the way, I encourage you to engage fully with the faculty 
advisors, mentors, administrators, and alum. Tell us what is important to you. Show us what you're passionate about. We are here to help you make the most of your academic and co-curricular life. Above all, I hope that you will commit yourselves to engaging with each other. Give each other the space, attention, patience, empathy, and respect required for the intellectual and interpersonal journey you are embarking on. The questions you ask of yourselves, your professors, each other, these questions and the answers you find will ripple out into the communities you will build and sustain beyond the gates and long after graduation. The communities you form and the questions you pursue will no doubt change our community and the world. But that comes later. We're here now together at the beginning. I would like to close with a brief word to all the parents and family members. As a father, I understand what it means to trust the care and safety and education of your children to others. The joy of seeing them thrive and the apprehension of letting go and about giving them the space to do so on their own terms. Our responsibility to them and to you is not taken lightly by anyone on this stage. We thank you for that trust, for kindling the fire of curiosity in your children, for creating a stage for them to launch from, and for the abiding love and support you will, that will sustain them in the years to come. And so, class of 2026, I look forward to seeing you on campus in the days and weeks ahead as we are beginning our adventure together. But for now, I will leave you with my respect and sincere excitement for the journey ahead. Good luck, and let's go. Thank you, Dean Surratt. At this time, I would like to introduce several of my colleagues here with us today. These, these individuals, along with the offices and staff with whom they work, support students in making the most of their Columbia experience. Lisa Hollibaugh, Dean of Academic Affairs for Columbia College. Barkley Morrison, Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Vice Dean of Undergraduate Programs for Columbia Engineering. Jenny Mack, Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate and Graduate Student Affairs for Columbia Engineering. Shannon Marquez, Dean of Undergraduate Global Engagement. Andrew Pla, Dean of Advising, who heads, up, who heads up the James H. and Christine Turk Barrick Center for Student Advising. And Kristen Crom, Dean of Undergraduate Student Life. works very closely with NSOP. <laughs> so, we hope that you will reach out and work with all of those introduced over the course of your four years with us. I would now like to invite Dean Surrett and Dean Chang, if you come up and join me here, and Charles Wallace, CC23, <laughs> Columbia College Student Council President, and Tamin Asif, uh, CS24, the Columbia Engineering Student Council and Academic Affairs Representative, to the podium for the reading of the Pledge and Code of Honor. We are honored to be here today. One of the roles of your student council academic affairs representatives is to help facilitate the creation of academic policy within our respective schools. We are here to serve any and all academic needs or requests from students. Through the work of the student councils and with the encouragement of the student body, both Columbia College and Columbia Engineering constructed a pledge and code of honor to help foster a community of academic integrity 
and to help remind us of the importance of honoring one's work while in college and going forward. Incoming students have already completed their academic integrity, integrity tutorials online and have signed their honor codes electronically. But to officially welcome you to our academic community and to complete an important Columbia tradition, we are now going to introdu introduce the pledge and honor code. Please turn to page six of your programs. Class of 2026, I ask that you now stand and recite the pledge with us in unison. Undergraduate students of Columbia University, I pledge, pledge to value, value the integrity of our ideas and the ideas of others by honestly presenting our work, respecting authorship, and striving not simply for answers, but for understanding and the pursuit of our scholastic goals. In this way, we, we seek, seek to build, build an academic, academic community governed by our collective efforts, efforts diligence, and code, code of honor. honor. Please remain standing while we lead you in the reading of the code of honor. Please recite the code of honor with us in unison. I affirm that I will not plagiarize, use unauthorized materials, or give or receive illegitimate help on assignments, papers, or examinations. I will also uphold equity and honesty in the evaluation of my work and the work of others. I do so to sustain a community built around this code of honor. Thank you. I would now like to call forward Amy Hungerford, Executive Vice President of Arts and Sciences and Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Amy Hungerford, the Ruth Fulton Benedict Professor of English and Comparative Literature, is Dean and Executive Vice President of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. In that role, she is responsible, among other things, for nurturing the excellence of the faculty who teach undergraduates and for ensuring Columbia's standing as a great research university across the arts, humanities, social sciences, and sciences. A scholar of 20th and 21st century American literature and the author of three important books in that field, she is also a devoted teacher. As a graduate mentor, she trained a generation of PhD and master's degree students who now work in higher education, high school teaching, and publishing. Her open access online course, The American Novel Since 1945, has been enjoyed by learners across the world since it was recorded in 2008. This spring, she will be teaching a section of literature humanities to first year students in the core. Yes. <laughs> Dean Hungerford joined Columbia as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in January of 2020 after 20 years at Yale, where she served for five years as Dean of Humanities and lived year-round with students while serving as head of an undergraduate residential college. Please join me in welcoming Amy Hungerford to the podium. Thank you, Dean Marinaccio and welcome class of 2026 and your families. A famous alumnus of Columbia once declared, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time, the ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles. 
Jack Kerouac wrote these words in his best known book, On the Road. And Fidel, I had no idea that On the Road, road trips were the theme of NSOP this year, so this seems appropriate. He came to Columbia to play football and found those mad ones here, a group of young writers and renegades who came to embody what would later be called the beat generation. They gave us a new tone in American writing and their daring talk remains with us today in journalism, poetry, advertising, and online culture. Columbia has long drawn students who crave incandescent discussion. For over a hundred years, the core curriculum has invited students to discuss ideas and works of art in a small group of peers for a sustained period of time. Students find themselves each week among fellow students and teachers whose ideals inspire, provoke new questions, and sometimes rebuild their minds from the ground up. At their best, such conversations spill out of the classroom up low steps on sunny days and out onto Broadway, to Tom's Restaurant, to Riverside Park, and to the One Train. This is to say, education is a social experience as well as an intellectual one. These days, that sociable promise can encounter some heavy weather. Bringing one's whole self to the seminar table can make the, the talk feel personal. The social psychologist Claude Steele, who served as provost of this university at one time, has recently dis, uh, studied the interpersonal dynamics of difficult conversations, a kind of modern stress he calls churn. My bet is that we've all felt it. Churn is what people feel when they fear they will be perceived, not for themselves, but through assumptions about a group, whether that is religious or racial, political or class-based. In his research, Steele discovered that an attitude of curiosity changes how people feel when talking about hard topics in diverse groups. Curiosity, it turns out, is a special antidote to the modern experience of churn. I have heard the classroom called a safe space, a brave space, and a space of intellectual freedom. Each of these contains a truth about the ideal seminar. But what if we thought of the seminar as the space of curiosity? And here we can borrow from the sciences, where the lab has traditionally been such a space. How does nature actually work? How do we solve problems? In biology, Columbia geneticists are discovering how evolution works by studying new and complex species. Our physicists and chemists make molecules dance at the junction of light and matter on tabletops in Pupin and Havermeyer Hall. The seminar is the lab of humanistic thought and should be equally curiosity driven. Professor Steele's research makes clear the human stakes. Curiosity in humanistic contexts is relational and it requires difference between persons, differences in what they know and how they think. There is little need for it in the absence of such differences. Sometimes students feel that they don't have insight, or to put it more negatively, that they don't have the right to speak about some subject because they lack knowledge, born of background or schooling. Sometimes when students feel that way, they are rightly registering their own desire to learn in the exciting space of the unknown. But the important thing is not whether one has a right to speak or something to say, for the seminar is not the space to present polished truths. It is where thinking happens. In that room, we invite you to be curious. What do you want to know? Ask that question and another and another. Jack Kerouac's mad ones, mad to talk, have sometimes struck me as a bit overbearing. If that's you, let your Roman candle energies ignite questions and fire up your ears to listen as well as your mouth to talk. When you are curious, the focus is not on yourself and all the doubts you might feel, but on the wonder of the world's great scope 
and all that is left for you to discover. In readings, you cross time and space. In the classroom, you cross social divides rarely bridged in ordinary settings. When you feel the churn, and you will, remember, be curious, and enjoy the fruits of discovery and friendship. Families, thank you for these extraordinary young people. Prepare to see them grow. First years, I wish you a wonderful start at Columbia. I can't wait to see some of you in my seminar and all of you igniting this campus with your presence. It is now my honor to introduce our next speaker, Lee C. Bollinger, for what will be his final convocation address as Columbia's president. To capture, to capture the depth and breadth of Lee's impact on this university over the last two decades would be impossible in what little time I have. But I can say that you would be hard pressed to find a university president working today who has left a more indelible mark on the institution they have served and on higher education more broadly. Under his leadership, Columbia is thriving as a center of scholarly excellence that is redefining what it means to be a research university in the 21st century. He has advocated for an innovative and sustainable approach to global engagement, led record-setting fundraising campaigns, and spearheaded the university's most ambitious physical transformation in more than a century. Nine global centers on four continents, a new school devoted to solving the climate crisis, a university-wide effort a university-wide effort committed to addressing the world's most serious challenges, and of course, our new campus in Manhattanville with buildings for brain science, the arts, special events, and our business school. These are just some of Lee's contributions to Columbia, in addition to the investments in student life, faculty, infrastructure, and our neighbors in Upper Manhattan, not to mention the creation of new centers, and initiatives across disciplines. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to work with him. We are thrilled that he will continue with his teaching and research at Columbia after he steps down at the end of June. Please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you very much. It is a very great pleasure and honor on behalf of Columbia University, joining our outstanding deans, Yosef Soret, Amy Hungerford, and Shifu Chang, to welcome you as among our newest students and members of our academic community. We know this is a profound step in your lives one naturally filled with extraordinary excitement, anticipation, and even some anxiety and apprehension. We also wish to extend an equally warm welcome to your parents and families and friends whom we know share in all of these feelings and more, some perhaps you will never know. We are grateful to them for entrusting us with your development as a person and as a scholar, and we will do all we can to fulfill those hopes and expectations. This is a day of enormous consequence for you, and as Amy said, of some consequence for me. This will be my last convocation address to entering students. At the end of this year, I will return to the faculty and continue teaching and writing full time. Other than my family, nothing has given me more pleasure and satisfaction in life than serving for two decades as president of this magnificent 
institution. During that time, <laughs> during that time, the university has changed significantly, as universities are inclined to do. And in one respect relevant to today, I would like to note it has changed a lot. When I began, this ceremony of greeting new students was held only in Levin Gym with a few desultory speeches and no family and friends welcome. That seemed out of character for a great institution and we immediately initiated this more appropriate and expansive gathering to better mark the moment and it is now a hallowed and treasured tradition. I therefore take very special pleasure in seeing all of you here this evening. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, Columbia has changed, but it is also important to say that its central mission of being utterly and completely dedicated to the life of the mind at the very highest levels, to the, to the discovery and advancement of knowledge and to the transmission of that intellectual process to each succeeding generation, and now to you, that central mission is the same. And every single day, we are eager to get to work, and now you will too. I have noted that this is my last convocation, not to draw attention to myself, but because I want to say to you this evening something that is distilled from my long experience. I have lived my entire adult life within universities beginning as an assistant professor of law at the age of 27. And the life of the mind has, has been my life's work. In that time, I have learned an enormous amount, of course. And I would like to share a few of the things I think might be helpful for you to consider as you start your journey. I have seven severely condensed thoughts to convey. But before doing that, I want to emphasize just how unique a great university like Columbia is in human affairs. We are all about knowledge, how to grasp it, work with it in our minds, add new dimensions others have thus far missed or overlooked and communicate all of that to the world. I believe universities are and should be more engaged with the outside world in making things happen for the better, what I refer to as the fourth purpose of universities, but that's for another day. What we do is hardly a small mission. Nearly everything we take for granted as making up the elements of modern life, including warnings and understandings about climate change, has roots in our academic research. I mention climate change not only because of its central importance to humanity, but also because it was first noted here at Columbia and serves as a prime illustration of my point about the role of universities and the special role of Columbia. In this community so dedicated to knowledge, we are constantly judging, indeed grading ourselves. Peer review is a serious enterprise on which the integrity of the whole thing depends. Therefore, you must be prepared to enter the life of the mind with eyes open and a readiness to be evaluated every day. With that, here are my recommendations for your journey. First, you can make yourself smarter if you work at it. This may be my most important message of all. In all likelihood, each of you will experience more intensely than you ever have before, not understanding something that others seem to get effortlessly. You may lose track of the discussion, listen to a lecture without following the argument, read a book and feel lost, look at a painting and see nothing special only to find later how others see layers and layers of meaning. 
and you may get grades below your expectations for yourself. The critical point is that you never feel any of this is due to an unchangeable part of your intellect. If I have learned one thing in life, it is that over time, perhaps over a lifetime, you can change your capacities of your mind for the better. You just have to believe that and to work at it. Sometimes it's due to terminology or concepts you are unfamiliar with. Not many people naturally speak in terms of opportunity costs or due process. Sometimes it's because our minds somehow throw us off, like when our natural sense of direction is confounded. And sometimes it's because we lack the knowledge base needed to enter the conversation. Great literature is often opaque to the uninitiated. And sometimes it's because we just don't follow the way in which the discussion is happening, using words rather than images. Whatever the reason, trust me, you can get better, indeed much better at thinking. But you must not accept where you are as a given and you must study yourself and practice doing better. You can catch up. You can build and improve your intellectual capacities. You can make yourself smarter. Many years ago, I asked a Nobel Prize physicist whether I could ever really understand quantum mechanics. He thought for a bit and then said no. He didn't think it was possible. It's possible he made some assessment of my intellect and concluded that I specifically could not understand it. But I prefer to interpret his comment as being that I needed to have a much deeper background in knowledge before I had a chance of really understanding. That's, of course, true of a lot of knowledge. And it doesn't stop me from trying to do better with the knowledge I have even though I know I'll never have as profound an understanding as others. I recommend you follow the same course. Second, you must constantly be alert to your bad intellectual impulses. This idea is related to the first. Thinking well is not easy. Indeed, it's not entirely natural. You have to work at that and against your instincts. This is a basic premise of my own field of freedom of speech, namely that censorship, <laughs> namely that censorship is more normal or natural than open-mindedness and tolerance. Forming beliefs and rejecting differing beliefs is what our minds do if not checked. Unfortunately, we are living in a period when this is even more prevalent than usual. In the university, we are all about seeing complexity, exploring different ways of seeing things, holding multiple perspectives and possibilities in one's mind simultaneously so we can examine them carefully, being skeptical, acknowledging we may be in error. So if your natural impulse is to simplify everything and to resist complexity, then you will continually struggle. So beware of your bad impulses. Third, I really encourage you to think big, even unrealistically big. Set big goals for yourself. Let yourself has, have high aspirations, both for knowledge and for doing things. Let yourself have your own big dreams. This is one natural impulse I would not discourage. It adds meaning to our lives, a sense of purpose, and for the most part is relatively harmless, depending, of course, on the substance of the dreams. Most importantly, as Samuel Johnson said, big dreams are often necessary, a necessary element to achieving anything in life for, quote, there would be few enterprises of great labor or hazard undertaken if we had not the power of magnifying the advantages which we persuade ourselves to expect from them. Fourth, 
you need to develop the capacity to be enthralled, enchanted by greatness. This is a complicated one, but the essence of the thought is that we need to develop a genuine respect for great works and accomplishments across the span of humanity, including an appreciation of expertise, something painfully lacking in today's political culture. How to do that, <laughs> how to do that is not as straightforward as one might think, but I have always found it beautifully captured in this quote from Virginia Woolf in her diaries. She writes, she writes of her astonishment at Shakespeare's genius when she turns to him while writing herself. Quote, I read Shakespeare directly I have finished writing. When my mind is agape and red hot, then it is astonishing. I never yet knew how amazing his stretch and speed and word coining power is until I felt it utterly outpace and outrace my own seeming to start equal and then I see him draw ahead and do things I could not in my wildest tumult and utmost press of mind imagine. This is indeed amazing to read a great writer appreciating an even greater writer. But the principal point is that we all need to find ways to have greatness become evident Greatness does not yield itself easily. Fifth, I urge you to make close friends along this journey of life beginning now. Here, I do not mean the personal friendships that are often and quite rightly thought of as being forged in your college years. I mean the great minds and works you will encounter in your studies. Select a few, those who appeal to something inside you and live with them. Make them part of your daily life. Read a page or a paragraph, or look at an image, or hear the sounds, or see the actions. And let your mind probe deeper and deeper into their meanings and hear your own thoughts in response. Great human achievements warrant a lifetime of attention. I urge you to begin to gather your closest friends among them. Remember, again, it's a lifetime journey you are embarking on today. And you can decide who your companions will be. I have mine. I hope you will have yours. Six, please do not let think that smartness is everything in life. This needs to be said because the intellect is such an overwhelming interest and focus of the university that it becomes necessary sometimes to acknowledge openly that we overemphasize one important dimension of life. Nowhere else in the world will you find anything close to us in ascribing the highest value to the intellect and its powers. We're good with that, and we hope you are too. But not for a second should you or do we think that that encompasses all that is important in a good life. Being a good person, as simple and as complicated as that little statement is, is certainly equally high on our list of human qualities. We try to be that here as well, but we also know, and you need to bear in mind always, that we are not doing everything here. I would only add that a, being a good person starts with how we treat each other in our little community. And as Edmund Burke observed, it radiates out from there to humanity broadly. And seventh and last, I urge you to enjoy this period of life you are entering because, in all likelihood, it will never be like this again. This unconditional, 
This unconditional embrace of the life of the mind we nurture here is unique. Nowhere else in the world will you encounter this way of being, certainly to this degree. It is in details that the larger world views are often revealed. And for us, that detail is the footnote. Everything that is possible to know and understand is our ambition. Reason is our method and our guide. And adding just a bit more is our goal. Every step is documented and attributed, and the footnote serves as our foundation. So whenever you see a footnote, think of the academic culture behind it. And so to recognize the uniqueness of our mission is also to realize that once you leave it, as most of you will at some point, life outside will naturally have different priorities. And those priorities will make this life difficult, if not impossible, to recapture. So I urge you not to take it for granted and to enjoy, enjoy it thoroughly while you're here. So these are my few recommendations to bring along with you on your journey. Of course, you will encounter many people offering many recommendations for you to follow, especially now at the beginning. I say take them all to heart. It's a natural impulse, again, a harmless one, for people to offer suggestions to those who are just starting out on some venture. And I'm sure you are being patient and tolerant of that inclination. Perhaps, while I have presented my own recommendation, recommendations, you have been thinking, after all that time, is this all he has to offer? <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree with that puzzlement. I can only say in my defense that I am still working on being smarter. I have not arrived at full command of my bad impulses. I am working with a set of completely unrealistic goals. I am painfully aware of how short I come up against the great minds we study here, including all of my closest friends. But remember, intelligence isn't everything. <laughs> and most of all, I want to say how much I and we look forward to being with you in these next four years in what promises to be an intellectual adventure of a lifetime. Congratulations. Thank you, President Bollinger. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce Kristen Crom, Dean of Undergraduate Student Life. In her role, Dean Crom works with multicultural affairs, residential life, and student engagement to enrich the undergraduate student experience. And she lives right here uh, in Wallach Hall. Anyone from Wallach? Okay. Please welcome Dean Crom to the podium to share her own words of welcome and as convocation comes to a close, to officially commence and sob. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am thrilled to welcome you to Columbia today both personally and on behalf of my team in undergraduate student life. After two and a half years that have been challenging for so many, having the opportunity to be in community together now means more than ever. You've been warmly welcomed today by so many, and in addition to the faculty and staff you will interact with over these next four years, 
our NSOP student leaders and resident advisors are here to support you and serve as a resource for you as you navigate Columbia, Morningside Heights, and New York City. We are all so eager to fill your first year with treasured memories, exciting experiences, and new connections. Each of you hails from locations around the country and around the globe, bringing unique experiences and perspectives that can transform our campus. Beginning today, throughout NSOP and beyond, I encourage you to take time to move beyond the quick hellos during initial meetings. Embrace your time in immersion experiences, residence halls, and classes as opportunities to dig deeper with your classmates, learning about both your commonalities and differences. Sometimes our greatest lessons and strongest bonds are with those who, at surface level, seem to share nothing in common. Your college years offer an incredible time to discover new passions, take risks, make some mistakes, and grow into the best version of yourself. Surely, focus on your academics, but get involved in the community beyond the classroom, prioritize your well-being, and have fun. <laughs> Take advantage of the many resources here and the many opportunities before you. One such opportunity that lies ahead of you now, which we hope is an exciting one, is finding where you feel most at home at Columbia. For me, as you heard, Columbia is literally home. I live right in Wallach. My children, now 17 and 14, have grown up within these gates and also see Columbia as home. For us, our home has little to do with the physical structure. It's really about our shared memories, laughter, and holding each other up on more difficult days. However you choose to become involved and spend your time, whatever academic path you take, activities you select, or clubs you join, these will be an important part of the foundation of the home you create here. And as you each forge your own journey and head down your own path, Continue to offer grace and compassion to each other, those in your home and in the larger Columbia family. Your classmates, soon to be friends and neighbors, your peers within the many undergraduate student organizations, faiths, teams, and service groups you join, my team, the staff you work closely with, your faculty, they're all here for you, ready to share in your successes, encourage you along the way, and lift you up when you need it most. You've already had an opportunity throughout the summer to meet many people through the Countdown at Columbia experience who are here to support your success in and out of the classroom. I assure you, there are hundreds more faculty and staff across Columbia College, Columbia Engineering, and throughout the university ready to support your success. Over the coming week, in addition to meeting your NSAP OLs, RAs, <laughs> You'll meet other sophomores, juniors, and seniors during community roundtables and identity discussions. You'll also have opportunities to meet with each other, perhaps at an open mic night or performance showcase. On September 9th, during one of our traditions called Activities Day, you can meet student leaders and sign up for the clubs and activities that interest you and you will find home. So take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, embrace this moment, and get ready. It's time to hop in and begin your Columbia journey. And now to close our program, I would like to invite the Kingsmen, Columbia's oldest all-male a cappella group, to lead us in singing our fight song, Roar, Lion, Roar, you will find the words on the last page of your program. And one note, after the academic recessional, following the fight song, we ask parents, families, and loved ones take a few minutes to say goodbye for now as students will depart officially and begin their NSOP. Join me in welcoming the Kingsmen. When? 
Then the bold teams of old wore the blue and white. Deeds of fame made their name here at Old Columbia. Nowadays we can praise fighting teams again. Hear the lion roar his pride while the men of Morningside follow the blue and white to victory. Roar, lion, roar, and wake the echoes of the Hudson Valley. Fight on to victory evermore. While the sons of Knickerbocker rally round Columbia, Columbia, shouting her name forever, roar, lion, roar, for all the water on the Hudson shore. One more time. Roar, lion, roar. Everybody! Break the echoes of the Hudson Valley. Fight on to victory evermore. While the sons of Knickerbocker rally round Columbia, Columbia, shouting her name forever.